Today's presentation is on a man you may never have heard of, but he more than anybody uh, put Florida on the map. His name was Henry Flagler. I have an old college friend who's watching back uh, who lives in West Palm Beach. He told me that when he goes on his daily bike ride, he goes past the Breakers Hotel and the Flagler Museum and Flagler Drive and the Florida East Coast Railroad, all reminders of Henry Flagler. And this is just one town in Florida. When Tuesday, our Tuesday morning fellowship uh, and Westminster member, Herb uh, Brownette, will tell you more about this remarkable entrepreneur and take you on a personal photographic tour of the Florida that Henry Flagler helped, helped invent. And uh, Dave Goodale just has a brief uh, uh, comment or uh, message. Message. There you go. Nate, one more. With those on the uh, Zoom session, please mute your phones so we don't. We're getting some background noise this morning. Thanks. Uh, we're working on uh, something extra special as we. Uh, uh, I think Don Lincoln is our uh, speaker on May 10th. And I'd like to just honor him a little bit. So I'm working on a Radley run buffet luncheon, crab cake buffet luncheon at Radley Run. Now, things have uh, gone up in price during this pandemic. Um, I just saw one, one buffet uh, that was 57 50 I'm trying to keep ours under 30. So, um, but I'll be simply invited. It will be a grand affair May 10th. If it all works out, I don't even, I've got to check on Don's schedule and make sure he's not running off to Presbytery or, you know, that he can make his own luncheon. So that, that's why I haven't circulated anything, but thanks for the time, Herb. I really appreciate it. I'll send out a blast email. Not on my email. Please uh, uh, try to get get to me so that I can uh, keep you on the list. Or just talk to me. Thanks. Well, thank you for having me. Excuse me one moment. I want to get that picture off. I don't know what that is. Nah, we'll leave it. Good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for having me back. Uh, I don't know how many of you saw my few pre previous presentations, but uh, you may know that I'm a uh, serious amateur historian. I'm actually a semi-retired company CFO, but um, I've, since ever since I was in about the fourth or fifth grade, I've, I've loved history and read about it. And I have several areas. You know, World War II is one of them. But a little bit more about my background, and I'm already telling you this because it's relevant to the topic, but I am an extremely rare individual. I am a native Floridian. Okay. Now, when I tell people that, they go, oh, no, really, where are you from originally? I think everybody thinks that, you know, the state was empty 70 years ago. <coughs> uh, well, about the time Flagler came along, it was practically empty. Uh, my grandfather was a carpenter, uh, grew up in a working class section of London. And he and his uh, best buddy uh, ended up and uh, did some work, and then they needed something to do. I said, his buddy said, you know, there's a place in America where there's going to be a lot of construction for at least another 10 years called Florida. And they uh, they stopped, and uh, they got as far as Jacksonville, Florida. And he went to work as a carpenter for a company, for a construction company. And by the end of his career, he was the general superintendent running all the field work. Uh, my dad became a contractor. My mother, he married, obviously married my mother, <laughs> um, was a, a very accomplished businesswoman and they ran, ran a company together. Uh, but I got the mom's genes, so I was on the finance side of construction. So uh, I've always had a passion for construction history. Uh, things like the Transcontinental Railroad, Panama Canal, Hoover Dam, Empire State Building, those are all fascinating projects. Uh, and then as a, as a, a native Floridian, I've always been interested in Florida history, 
So about 15 years ago, I was browsing one of those uh, really quaint uh, little bookstores, beach town bookstores <clears throat> in Vero Beach, Florida, and I found this book, Last Train Paradise. Uh-oh. Okay. All right. Close. Not sure what happened. I think I want to do something. No, keep I'll keep talking. Okay. Uh, about Henry Flagler and how he built these railroads and all. And I got so interested that I uh, said about traveling to these sites. Uh, if you heard me speak this <coughs> you know, I believe you can't really appreciate history until you visit the locations of where they happened. So, uh, so who was, uh, well, before I start with Flagler, let me talk a little bit about Florida history. In Florida in the 19th century, Florida became a state in 1819. I mean, it was purchased from Spain in 1819, and in uh, 1845, it became the 27th state of the Union. The reason it took so long was it was a slave state, which became part of the Confederacy. But in those days, you had to have a, they had a deal where you had to admit a free state to uh, admit a, uh, a slave state. Uh, most people at that time, uh, and, and they, there weren't that many, but most of them lived in the uh, Jacksonville to Pensacola axis, the I-10 corridor, the upper part of the state. They generally felt that uh, the interior of the state below that was so uninhabitable that nobody would ever live there. So they um, made the state capital a quaint little village. It was exactly halfway between Jacksonville and Pensacola, and that was Tallahassee, where uh, I spent six wonderful years uh, getting a bachelor's and an MBA degree. Great years. Uh, those of you who've been to college know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the interior, uh, the rest of the state, the people who lived in coastal communities huddled in forts because the interior of the state was largely controlled by the fierce Seminole Indian tribe. And so that's why there's so many towns in Florida named Fort, Fort Pierce, Fort Lauderdale, Fort Myers, Fort Walton. That's, that's why they were forts. <clears throat> if, if you lived in Southern Florida, you were on the coast, except for a very few rugged uh, whites, I use that term for lack of a better one, who lived in the interior and uh, scratched out a hard scrabble living, rounding up wild cattle, uh, growing what vegetables they could and all, uh, very, very tough people. But in order to control the cattle, uh, they had these 20 foot long whips and they could uh, whip them out and crack them very accurately. You could crack it over the head of a cow. You could take the head off of a rattlesnake. Uh, you know, you could actually kill a rabbit with it. So it had lots of practical uses. <clears throat> so to this day, rural, rough around the edges people in Florida are called crackers. And that's the, der that's the derivation of that, uh, that term. Um, I do want to talk briefly about the Seminole Indians. My alma mater is Florida State Seminoles. You wonder in this era of uh, <coughs> not using Indian names, how do they get away with that? Well, they get away with it because they have a licensing agreement with the Seminole Indian tribe. <laughs> when the uh, NCAA, money. Huh? money, yeah. When the NCAA crack, started cracking down on it, the first person to object was the chief of the Seminole Indian tribe, who said, and I quote, once again, a bunch of white men are deciding what's good for Indians. And uh, so they, they, they licensed the, uh, the name, they licensed the, uh, or, or, you know, the war emblem, that's, that's the logo of the school. Um, if, you're, if you ever watch one of their football games and the guy rides out on the horse with the flaming spear, that costume is authentic and handmade by Seminole women. And Seminole children get a free education at Florida State. So, uh, and then his last comment was, and why wouldn't we with our tradition of being fierce warriors? And by the way, they were the only Indian tribe that was never militarily defeated by the United States. They uh, were driven in, they were you know, eventually uh, subdued by you know, just suppression and, and economics, but uh, so their, their moniker is undefeated. And so anyway, why would a tribe with our heritage not be like to have its name attached to one of the best sports programs in the country. So anyway, that's uh, a little bit about Seminoles. Uh, obviously, I'm prejudiced about. <laughs> um, another book 
that I want to recommend. You want, if you're interested in learning about Frontier, Florida, a land remembered by uh, Patrick Smith. Uh, this is considered uh, the best novel ever written about Florida. Uh, if, if you go online, I mean, it's right up there with the yearling. If you ever had or, or, read, or ever read the yearling, great book. Uh, but it's about uh, a frontier family in Florida starting in World War II, I mean, starting in the Civil War. And uh, I'm not giving away anything because this is the start of the book. By the end of the book, the third generation of the family is a, is a multimillionaire developer. Uh, and everything the family goes through, but it's uh, very interesting. Not room for poet or room for All right. So, obviously, that's Henry Flagler. Who was Henry Flagler? Well, he was born in 1830 in Northwest uh, New York State. He was the son of, you're going to love this, a Presbyterian minister. And he grew up in a very strong Christian environment and until the day he died, he was a staunch Presbyterian. He, uh, he developed a good character uh, for powerful men of the era. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't womanize, he didn't eat or drink to excess. Uh, he tried to treat the people around him well, including even the, the lowly workers, which for that period of time was, was very unusual. He did, however, uh, as was the custom of the day, practice at, have uh, utilized totally ruthless business practices when it came to competitors. So a great guy to work for, not a good guy to compete with. So uh, <laughs> he, uh, he tried several businesses. He ended up as a grain merchant. And, he, and in doing that, he figured out that the best way to get a competitive advantage with a commodity was to control transportation. So he negotiated uh, very favorable freight rates uh, with uh, railroads and locked them up, which made his grain cheaper. Um, after doing that for a little while, he, uh, he reconnected with a former uh, associate in grain merchant business, a guy named John D. Rockefeller. And Rockefeller had the vision to see that the, the energy future of America was petroleum. And he also figured out that you know, drilling for petroleum was very hit and miss. You can make a lot of money or you can lose a lot of money, but it all had to be refined. So he set about uh, buying refineries. Uh, he joined forces uh, with uh, Flagler and Flagler worked on the transportation side. So he, uh, he created uh, contracts with rail railroads to, to block out other refineries they built and, and bought pipelines. And in, in 1870, they formed Standard Oil. Now, they actually, to show how close they were to each other, they lived on the same block. They walked in New York City. They walked to work together every day. They shared an office with their desks facing each other. Went to lunch together every day and walked home together. Um, they did that for 15 years, and uh, by the time, uh, after 15 years, they controlled 90% of the refineries and pipelines in the United States. And Standard Oil, of which Flagler owned 30%, and Rockefeller owned 50%, was the most valuable company in the world. So they were the you know, Bezos or or uh, Gates or, or uh, Musk. Musk or whoever you want to pick of, of their day, uh, along with some other folks, you know, like Carnegie and Morgan and Vanderbilt. So that's who Henry Flagler was. Uh, so in 1881, he visited Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, with his then second wife, his first wife had passed away from an illness. And he was told that there was a quaint little Spanish colonial town down the coast. And I get something there. No, okay. That went away. I think I know ours is a picture. Anyway. Called St. Augustine. <clears throat> now, where did you get St. Augustine? There's no bridge across the river in Jacksonville. If, you know, if you've been there, it's, the river is very narrow in downtown, but it's very deep. 
So he had to cross by ferry, you get on a cranky railroad and go down there. He fell in love with the place. He said, I want to spend more time here. And then he said, if I'm going to spend time here, I want all my buddies, you know, the Rockefellers and some of those other folks, I want them here with me. And if I'm going to get them here, I better build a hotel. And given the quality of the people I want to attract, it needs to be the nicest hotel in the world. So he started set about building the Ponce de Leon Hotel. The other problem was they have to get there. So uh, he asked, why is there not a bridge over the water and uh, over the river in Jacksonville? They said, well, it's deep and it's challenging and engineers say it can't be done. Uh, he said, Fooey, our best engineers in the world built a railroad bridge across the, uh, the uh, river in Jacksonville. Uh, the little cranky railroad, the Jacksonville St. Augustine Railroad was not a standard gauge and it was not well maintained. So what do you do if you're you know, worth a lot of money? You, you buy the railroad. And uh, he tore up the track, put down standard track, and built, built the line down to St. Augustine. Uh, and coming back to it, keep in mind that in this day and time, there was no income tax and no inheritance tax. Uh, the uh, standard oil was uh, broken up in 1911, uh, which you probably know. And, uh, you know, Roosevelt and the trust busters, uh, which he vehemently fought. What's interesting is after they broke it up, the, the individual pieces became more valuable than the original company. So they actually got even more wealthy. So uh, by the time he died in 1913, he was worth the equivalent today of, of $12.5 billion. And that's after spending all this money on Florida and railroads there. Uh, the Ponce de Leon uh, Hotel uh, was, uh, he preserved the architecture of the era of the, he wanted a Spanish colonial architecture so it would fit in with the town. He, uh, he heavily involved in building, he, he picked out all the artwork, all the interior stuff, and as it arrived, he would actually go down and help unpack it and, uh, and inspect it. And someone asked him, you know, well, why, why are you doing all this? And he goes, well, I've spent my whole life being an accumulator, and now I want to be a creator. So it was very personal to him that this hotel uh, be uh, be the nicest it could be. He also built a very impressive Memorial Presbyterian Church, as I know, <laughs> which is still there, and he built some municipal buildings, all with his own money. Now, that hotel is now the dormitory building of Flagler College, which is a really good uh, liberal arts college in St. Augustine. And uh, it's not open to the public. However, we were down there last uh, <coughs> summer, and uh, you know, Pam has a, uh, my partner Pam has a niece that goes to college there, and uh, she was able to take us in and show us the hotel. So, yes. Okay, that'll work. Okay. So as you can see walking up, you can see the uh, Spanish architecture. You know, it looks like something right out of Cordoba. That's the courtyard in the front. Now, when you walk in, this was the lobby. So when you know, in, in, uh, when it opened in the 1890s, if you walked in, this was the first thing you saw. If you looked up, you, know, you saw this oh yeah, all this ornate uh, woodwork and ceiling. This rotunda, which I think is fabulous. And by the way, the school has spent $30 million restoring all this stuff to its original condition to their credit. Oops. Just to give you an idea of his attention to detail, I mean, this is a column. Just to be a wood column, but look at that. It's a piece of art. This floor. Don't see floors like that in the hotels anymore, do you? Oops. That's just uh, off the lobby going up some stairs. So that's what it looked like when it was finished. And uh, so he gets done. Now he's getting up in his 60s now. I mean, you know, in that era, he's, he's not a young guy. And uh, he's, yeah, that was pretty fun. <laughs> I think I'll. Uh, 
you know, maybe build some more hotels down the coast. You know, we all have hobbies, you know, retirement hobbies. I build model cars and planes. He built luxury hotels. So good. <laughs> nice to be rich. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, so he uh, he goes down. He finds Ormond Beach, Daytona. Yeah, builds a hotel there. Builds the railroad down. He uh, he then went further down. He discovered what he thought was one of the most beautiful islands he ever saw. A place called Palm Beach Island. And at that time, it was just uh, a sand spit, had it 12 like ramshackle houses on it. And he built uh, the original Breakers Hotel on the site of the current hotel. That hotel uh, burned down a few years later. It was replaced and it was eventually replaced in the 20s with the uh, current Breaker Hotel. But when you think about Palm Beach Island, if you've been there, uh, well, first of all, you can't see a lot because there's all these hedges, but, you know, that's where Mar-a-Lago is, that's where the Kennedy compound is, the breakers. And uh, so he liked spending time there, so he built a vacation home there uh, named Whitehall Mansion. It's your typical Florida vacation cottage. Yeah, cottage. <laughs> uh, <laughs> where, uh, when he first built it, they only stayed there three three weeks a year. Wanted to see got more and more involved in Florida and spent more time there, okay? Uh, you know, this era, Mark Twain called this era the Gilded Age. And uh, this is a, uh, if, if you've been to uh, the Breakers in Newport um, or, or um, the, uh, in uh, Ashford, uh, I mean, uh, Asheville, yes. the Biltmore, you know, it's, it's not as big, but it's uh, certainly impressive. So if you were to visit there uh, for an evening, um, you would enter this entry hall. You'd dine here. After dinner, the ladies would retire to the music room. <laughs> the men would retire to the billiard room for cigars and brandy. Is that a cool man cave or what? <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, after the guests left, the uh, flagless would retire to their master bedroom, and they would get up in the morning and uh, spend some time together in their morning room, which was adjacent to the bedroom. So, uh, after which Henry would go downstairs to his office and work through the day. So, I mean, he's a hardworking guy right up to the end of his life. So, uh, it was a Good luck. Okay. All right. Just a second. I got something out of work. Nope, I did. Okay. So he's comfortable in Whitehall. And all along the railroad down there, you, know, you can't make money on a railroad just carrying passengers. And he was first and foremost a businessman. So all down the east coast of Florida, he invested heavily in the local businesses. Uh, buying shares in them or making loans to them. Uh, and he, uh, he really jump started the, the citrus industry. He, uh, the, the cattle, uh, he helped uh, the cattle guys. They didn't have to drive cows as far anymore. Uh, but other industries, timber, <coughs> turpentine, uh, all these things uh, that, are, that are sort of the staple of Florida. Uh, plus, uh, creating the image that this was a good place to visit, just to go visit. Uh, so he, he did all that down the East Coast. So he's he's uh, he's uh, doing well and he's happy in Whitehall. And there was a town further down the coast called Fort Dallas. And Fort Dallas was a village of about 500 people with a few dirt roads. That was it. It's the 1890s. Uh, there was a lady uh, who was a widower. She had moved there with her kids, two children named Julia Tuttle. 
and she was the self-proclaimed uh, promoter of Fort Dallas. And she kept writing Flagler saying, this is a beautiful place. You need to come see it. You need to build a hotel. You need to build your railroad down here. So he kept kind of blowing her off. He's fine where he is. But finally, they had a very hard, they had a really, really severe winter. And um, I guess 1894. Yeah, 1894. And she sends him a case of oranges and a bunch of orchids and says, it's not freezing in Fort Dallas. So he says, you know, if nothing else to get this lady off my back, maybe I'll go down there. You know, and there weren't good roads and all. He had to actually go by water. And he gets there and he says, you're right. This is a beautiful place. And I should build a hotel here. But, you know, Fort Dallas is not a very catchy name. And there's another town called Dallas, and there's going to be confusion. He said, I will build a hotel here if you change the name of the, the town. And she said, well, what do you want to change it to? He says, I like the name of the river. Let's call it Miami. So in 1894, Miami was 500 people in dirt streets. I find that. If you've ever been there now, I find that astonishing. So he builds a road. He built a beautiful hotel on Key Biscayne. I mean, on the Biscayne Bay, built the railroad down there. So so now he starts thinking the Panama Canal is being built. It's going to open up. The largest city in Florida in, in, in the 1890s was Key West, and it was a good deep water port. And he thought, you know, this stuff has got to get into the country somehow, and, it's, and it needs to get to a railroad. And if you actually look at a map, and you go straight up from the Panama Canal, you go around the edge of Cuba, and you keep going, you know, the first thing you come to is Key West. And he started having the idea of if you could connect Key West by railroad to the mainland, you know, it, that would be a really good business to Now there's a, there, and, and so he envisioned to keep what's called Key West Extension. Now there's a lot of talk about why he did this. You know, maybe uh, he's getting on in years. I mean, he's now like in his seventies. Uh, you know, maybe it was a legacy thing. Maybe it was a challenge because everybody said it couldn't be done. They called it Flagler's Folly. <laughs> um, but he, uh, he hired the best engineers in the world. Uh, he was 74 when it started. It was built from 1905 to 1912. Uh, it's 165 miles, 42 bridges, across three major bodies of water. He employed at any time during the construction, it had ups and downs, 1,000 to 3,000 workers. And one of the interesting things, if you study the, I got a whole book just on the construction aspects of it. So logistics. There's nothing in the Keys. You know, there's no water, there's no food, there weren't any people. So everything had to be shipped and initially by water. And as they worked down, you know, more and more by railroad. Uh, and water was an issue. Somebody here, uh, uh, sorry, I was getting ready, but showed me a picture of trains with water things. Uh, you had to ship every day enough water down there to, for 3,000 people. Just water. Okay. Um, they did make heavy use of local materials. Uh, they would uh, use pump sand out of the ocean and they would uh, excavate uh, uh, limestone, which was great fill. Uh, and also something called marl, <coughs> which is sort of wet, not quite dry limestone on, on the bottom of the ocean. So uh, now it might be dawning on you now that there's, there were no environmental considerations because you see going out there now and just digging up stuff. And uh, they also, Wherever there was shallow water, rather than by building bridges, they built causeways, so they would pump sand up it. And so if you ever drive down the, uh, the overseas highway, I'm sure a lot of you have, you know, you come to these sections where there's just long spits of land and, you know, a few mangroves on each side and just water. And, you know, well, that's, that's why they did it. They moved, you have to be a construction person to really appreciate this, 17.9 million cubic feet of fill. By, by steam shovel and manual labor. 
That's the equivalent today. You know, these big triaxial dump trucks you see out on 202. That's the equivalent to over 8 billion of those. Uh, some of the shorter bridges, they, uh, they initially use wood trestles to, to get it done, and then they, they eventually uh, replace them. Uh, they experienced three hurricanes while they were building it. And the first one, they didn't really understand hurricanes. They had um, what was called a quarter boat. It was quarters for workers. Uh, and there were uh, about 140 of them on there. And it broke loose and it sank. And over 100 of them drowned. Uh, he was very upset about that. He said, you know, from now on, we're going to take hurricanes seriously. Uh, their safety record for the era is, is actually pretty uh, astonishing. Oops. Um, they had 158 deaths during construction. I don't think they had. Um, thank you. 132 from hurricanes, mostly the first. 21 blasting accidents. In those days, dynamite was pretty unstable, and that was just a hazard of that. Uh, <laughs> And then only five other from things like you know falling off the of stuff and all that, which which is uh, pretty good. Like I said, in an era when you didn't have OSHA and, and a lot of people weren't worried about safety, that it's actually a pretty good record. Uh, as they got farther down, uh, the uh, the engineers pushed hard to finish. They knew Flagler uh, was getting old, and once again, the people that worked for him were intensely loyal to him. They really loved the guy. And they worked their hearts out because they wanted him to be able to ride the railroad all the way to Key West before he died. He was once again hands-on. He would inspect things uh, frequently. And one of the fu funny stories was uh, he had a motor launch that kind of ringed him up and down. And, and one day uh, they're going down. Unfortunately, it was pretty calm. And the, the guys, you know, driving, he's, he's sitting on the back. He's sitting in the back, you know. And he turns around and he's not there. <laughs> the guy whips the boat around and he sees in the distance a you know, 70 something year old flagler in the water doing this. Okay. So, anyway, the, uh, the original budget was 26 million uh, and ended up being about 50 million, which is equivalent to $6 billion uh, in today's money. He, uh, he financed all these projects, by the way. He didn't just spend his own money. He, uh, he borrowed money against his stock and created companies that had all this, and then the companies would, would pay the debt off. Um, so anyway, but still, it is, it, it is still the large, single largest private infrastructure project, privately financed infrastructure project wow. in U.S. history. Uh, So on January 22nd, uh, 1912, he rode this railroad car, which is actually at the mansion, car number 91, which he called Rambler. Uh, he rode it from Miami to Key West. Oh, that JPEG uh, can't open. It's four minutes currently on Sorry about that. I, I keep talking. About it. Uh, I was going to show you the interior of the car, but there, there we go. So, as you can see, it was uh, pretty nice. Uh, one of the uh, cabinet members of the Taft administration wrote Woody. this all the time. I mean, he was building railroads, right? So 
sorry that ain't a big picture. So he arrived in Key West at this little station, uh, which was the station, to a crowd of over 10,000 people cheering and, and yelling, and uh, at which point they quit calling it Flagler's Folly and they started calling it the eighth wonder of the world. And uh, they believe that's probably the largest crowd ever uh, assembled in Key West, although I've been there doing spring break, so I don't like <laughs> <laughs> So there were three signature bridges. Uh, there was the Long, Long Key Vida, 2.67 miles that crossed from Long Key to Conk Key. It was a concrete arch bridge with 186 arches. There was a seven mile bridge, uh, which uh, had concrete pylons and steel spans. And it went from Vaca Key to Little Duck Key. Vaca Key is where Marathon is. Marathon is actually not a key, it's a town. Uh, and it's a town that Flagler built. It was, it's, if you've been there, it's a good sized island. So it's about halfway down. So they built, it, they, they made it a staging area and a housing area and a switching yard and all sorts of things. And, uh, and when they were thinking about what to name it, one of the engineers said, boy, this project's turning into a marathon. And so that's uh, the name stuck. So the, uh, the, the last, oh, and it, it crossed Kitchen, Pigeon Key, where they, which was a small island, and they built a work camp there uh, so that people would be further out, but it also kept them away from uh, some of the uh, sins of a, a railroad town that uh, is a very controlled environment, as you'll see in a minute. Um, and then the last signature bridge, the Bahia Honda Bridge. Uh, was uh, Bahia Honda is, is a very deep channel. Uh, they wanted longer spans because it's going to be such a hard time building mm -hmm. the pylon. So they use a traditional uh, railroad a box frame, which you'll see in a minute. And I'm going to show you pictures of all of these in a minute. Uh, the, uh, the railroad was never um, profitable. And uh, in 1935, a hurricane hit the Keys. Oops. All right. I'll tell you real quick. That's the that's the Memorial Presbyterian Church in St. Louis, seen at Flagler Mill. And and that's where it's buried. Okay. Sorry, I don't have a better picture, but I was with a bunch of other folks and going to see Henry Flagler's. Uh, including two young grandchildren and seeing Henry Flagler's grave was not on their list of activities. So <laughs> <laughs> that's as close as I got. But anyway, uh, yeah, that's it. now <clears throat> I don't want to start an argument about climate change, but the two worst hurricanes that ever hit the U.S. were the, were the uh, 1901 hurricane that hit Galveston, Texas. Uh, and this hurricane that hit the Middle Keys went over right over Isla Mirada in 1935. And they were both, I think they're considered the only two probably category five storms. So Isla Mirada is about a few feet above sea level, got hit uh, by a uh, category five hurricane. Um, at the time, as, as one of the Depression era make work projects, the federal government was building the overseas highway to Key West, and they were building it parallel to Flagler's Railroad. And so they had a bunch of workers on the island. The railroad told them, there's a hurricane coming, you need to get them off. And they said, no, oh, no, don't worry, you know, it's still be fine. You know, a bunch of guys living in tents. Okay. Um, the railroad, on their own initiative, uh, decided to send a rescue train to try to bring back as many people as they could. And it left um, uh, Miami. There's a little bit of trouble getting it together and getting it out of the yard, and also it took a little longer than they thought. And it arrived just about the time the hurricane hit. And that's the significance of the title, Last Train <coughs> in Paradise. Uh, after the storm, you can see the total devastation. The whole island looked like this. That's what happened to the train. Wow. Wow. Uh, You'll notice the only thing, uh, two of the survivors were the, uh, the engineer and the fireman. They just hunkered down in the cab. I mean, waves actually washed over all 
all of this. So they were in a cab with you know, waves and, and everything. It wiped out 20 or 30 miles of the railroad, at which point the Florida East Coast Railroad said, this has never been profitable. We're not going to rebuild. And that was the end of the Key West extension. Somebody had the idea of, gee, the federal government's building a highway. Why don't we sell them the road bed and sell them the major bridges and they won't have to replicate it. So that's, that's what happened. And so uh, if you, once again, if you're driven down US 1 to Key West, that whole road is, is, is the flag of right away. And, and if you went before about 1970, you actually went over a couple of bridges. So um, on Isla Mirada, they have a memorial for the people who died in the hurricane. This is uh, the spot where they think the eye passed over. And uh, at the base of the memorial is, is a beautiful uh, mosaic of, of the Florida Keys. So our first stop is uh, Long Key Vida. Uh, it was uh, originally they did build a highway over it, but then when they, they built the uh, current highway, which is right next to it, they actually took it back to its original dimensions. You can see all this fabulous archwork uh, as, as a construction infrastructure kind of guy. I, I actually found this probably the most interesting bridge. But anyway, you can see it's right next to uh, to the highway. Uh, they let people fish off of it. Probably the world's uh, most substantial fishing pier. Uh, shaking things here. The, um, now those lines, that's the bike path, but that was also the width of the railroad track. So you can see you know, how wide it was. <coughs> You can see uh, yeah, this, the detail, the, those, those lines are from the, the wooden uh, framework used to frame it. I'm going to shake this tape. Okay, now I really screwed up. Sorry. <laughs> Question, Howard, while we're waiting. Yeah. Uh, you know, Rockefeller had, uh, you know, some well-known descendants. Did Flagler have descendants? Well, um, he had two, he had, actually had three children. One of them, two girls, a boy and two girls. One of them passed away as a child. Uh, his daughter, uh, as was uh, custom of the time of wealthy uh, women, um, devoted her life to social causes. Uh, his son, um, he, he wasn't a bad person, but he just never got engaged in the business and everything. But he actually, uh, his, there were issues with his second wife. He ended up, um, his third wife was like 30 years younger than that. And he actually left the estate to her and her family. And um, over time, you know, it got diluted. So there aren't even, like there's still Rockefellers running around, there aren't, and Vanderbilt's running around, there aren't flaggers running around that have money. Okay. Interestingly enough, if you watched the basketball game last night, his third wife, um, with the money she had, she had gone to the University of North Carolina and she gave a lot of the money to start their business school which is called the, some other name, Dash Flagler Business School. So anyway, you can, you know, you can appreciate, you know, just how dramatic this is. Now, these, uh, these were uh, foundations being built for the overseas highway before the hurricane. So they were gonna actually build a, a, you know, a, a traffic bridge parallel to Flagler's thing. So uh, while it was a tragedy for the people involved, 
the hurricane actually did the government a big favor because it it made that that project uh, much more cost effective and i'm going to be very gentle here okay so how do they build these things well first of all they would they would drive piling into the sandy or uh, the bottom they build a coffer dam they then within the coffer dam uh, build framework rebar they build the arch framework out of wood uh, and they could they could transport you know they didn't do it from scratch every time they had these arch frames and they would move them along. Uh, if you're familiar with current construction, um, you know, re reusable uh, formwork is, is pretty common in construction. Uh, now this shows two together, but interestingly enough, they would build them every other because if if uh, before it got finished, they were afraid if you had too long a length. The forces of, of nature and wind and all might you know rupture something so they would build every other arch and then go back and fill in yeah, i don't know if y'all find this interesting but i find it fascinating <laughs> and that's what it looked like when it was finished okay next stop seven mile bridge uh, here you can see on the right uh, the bridge that flagler built and on the uh left is the modern US-1 bridge, which opened in 1972. Uh, like I said, you can go out to, to uh, Pigeon Island, where they have restored the work camp. On the bridge, this is the actual bridge. Uh, you can walk or ride a bike. It's about two and a half miles. I didn't have a bike. I didn't want to work two and a half miles in the Florida sun. So I took the boat. Come in here, here, here it is. Uh, you'll notice that they, you know, they've put gaps in these bridges to, to keep people from going out on them further than they should. Uh, these bridges are actually becoming a bit of a problem for the state of Florida because they have great historical significance, but they are deteriorating and starting to fall down, which is uh, a hazard both to, uh, you know, to navigation and people around it and everything. So they'll I'll have to deal with that sooner or later. So here you come ashore. This was the superintendent's house. Uh, there's that gap. Uh, this is interesting because the bridge goes right over the top of the island. It uh, goes right over the island. So you can actually get under it and see how it was built. So this section is, is that our show? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that was the original railroad bridge. And then when they built the highway, they, they cantilevered uh, these, these braces over it and, uh, and laid uh, Pavement on top of that built the overseas highway. This is just gives you an idea of you know, this is where the people lived. That's uh, dining hall. Few the uh, few people that uh, work with the park or still live out there. So anyway, um, I want to point out here these rails. I think the next picture shows it better. Uh, every now and then the government does something smart. And, and and when they were building the highway, they need railing, so they took the rails from the railroad that they tore up and converted it to the railing for the bridge. So all this railing was was originally Flagler Railroad track. Recycled material, I guess we would call it. So there's uh, there's the end of the bridge. Uh, this gives you a pretty good idea again of how they built it. Uh, that this was the original railroad is this they build these pilings they had these steel box frames that they would take out on a railroad car and hoist the cross on a crane lay them down and then of course uh, the, the uh, highway was built on this uh, cantilevered um, bed you can see uh, at least in this area the water is fairly shallow across a lot of this stretch which which made the uh, work a lot easier now, how did they build these guys? Same thing, coffer dam, frame it, build it up, put the steel on it. All right, our next stop is the Bahia Honda Bridge. Now, as I told you before, it's box frame. It's a very deep, fast running channel. Actually on Shark Week this week, they, they had a, a, a session on, they discovered that this little body of water here has uh, one of the most, it is densely populated hammerhead shark populations in the world and many of them never leave the bay or, or the, the inlet they, they spend their whole life there which is unusual all right back to bridges so um 
you can see it's traditional railroad uh, box frame and then they had to build a highway across the top of that because the frame wasn't wide enough for uh, for cars and and so they uh yeah they built this structure on top of the bridge that is old us one uh one thing i, I remember uh, as a kid uh, we we drove to key west on a family vacation in the late 50s so we would have driven across these bridges I find that scary narrow. <laughs> it's a two-lane <laughs> bridge, you know, with people going up and down it, you know, uh, in a tropical vacation environment, as in some of them might you know, not be sober. Uh, so anyway, they, I think they did have a lot of accidents on these bridges. There it is. You'll also notice uh, this water pipe. Uh, they also uh, built you know, piping down to Key West eventually. This is the other end of the bridge. So once it got in shallow water, they went back to their uh, traditional uh, style of uh, construction. You can see it's uh, deteriorating. So one year after the bridge was finished, uh, in 1913, uh, Flagler was uh, upstairs in his Whitehall mansion in a back hall some door or something swung open and, and hitting, and he fell down a steep uh, back, back staircase and uh, sustained fatal injuries. He, he died a few days later. And uh, that was when I was going to uh, show you the church. <laughs> so what was his legacy? Well, first of all, he created the infrastructure that modernized eastern, at least eastern Florida. And by the way, one of the reasons the railroad wasn't successful, while Flagler was doing this, another gentleman also named Henry Henry Plant, building a railroad through the middle of the state down to Tampa. And uh, Plant City in Florida is named after him. Um, and, uh, and his mansion is actually the uh, administration building of Tampa University. But anyway, uh, and that's really where the canal traffic went there because uh, it was a bigger bay and it was it was a shorter journey out of there. But anyway, but he did modernize East Coast of Florida. He established Florida as a tourist destination. It's the place you could go and go to a nice hotel and just stay for the sake of it. Uh, he accelerated the, no pun intended, budding citrus industry. Uh, it was starting to develop before he got there, but they, they didn't have an easy way to get stuff to market. And he helped that. And he's he's a, he's a widely acknowledged as, as the father of Miami. So um, that is uh, a little bit of construction history and history about my home state. So hmm. any questions? Yeah, I have a good question. On the floor, on the Key West Highway, where when you drive on it, were some of those what we think of as being islands were they man-made some of those from dredging or were they all little islands uh no what they did was a lot of those causeways were little islands that they connected but they didn't make any no, artificial they, islands uh no more. okay no not just for the second island okay so yes one of the DuPonts gets credit for developing railroads in Florida. How did that fit in? Um, I'm not sure. I haven't heard that. I, 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 I yeah. do know. I was going to say the same thing about yeah. DuPont because we're all in the front. Um, I, I do know that they, um, in my hometown of Jacksonville, Florida, south of town on the uh, east side of St. John's River, they built a nice estate. And in the 20s, they built a nice hotel uh, about a mile from their house right on the river. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Bowles School, but it's a, a very prestigious prep school that I had the honor of attending. And that old hotel uh, is the dorm building, or was, I don't think it's a boarding school anymore, but it, it, it was uh, uh, it was a day in a boarding school, but anyway. Um, that hotel was the dorm and administration building for Gold School. Uh, now, <laughs> my grandfather 
was the construction superintendent on that hotel. So, hmm. um, but I don't know why the DuPonts got to North Florida. And, well, I, uh, I think it was the, I can't keep track of all their first names, but the, the guy that built that estate that has the glass shards in the top of the wall down on 141. One of the, yeah. the hospitals. Um, he was kind of an outcast. And I think he went off to Florida and did some development. Yeah, they had a railroad up in the panhandle that went into St. Andrews Bay, and I think it served pulp and cellulose traffic mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Yeah, it wasn't they, down in the uh, peninsula, well, it was up in the uh, top. Because at the end of this, uh, even in the 1880s, Florida had very few railroads. They had a few little local things, you know, like the Jacksonville San Luisi line, but they had no major railroads. And, and one reason all these people could do this was the state of Florida was very generous about giving you land and right of ways. Uh, if you want to build a railroad, just tell us what you want, we'll give it to you in the way of land. So, um, so that's. Uh, that might have been motivating uh, people because North Florida is paper pulpers, a big paper, uh, paper pulp is a big deal. And uh, I started out life as a CPA with Coopers and Library in Jacksonville, Florida. And, and one of our clients was the St. Joe Paper Company. And uh, I actually spent a week in St. Joe, Florida, which is was such a speck on the map. They had a uh, company mansion where visitors stayed because there were no hotels. <laughs> but anyway, uh, any other questions? Well, once again, thanks. Thanks for uh, having me back. And really